Hey everyone, we're here in Cape Cod, Massachusetts at Steve Connor's workshop uh, where he's built this wonderful guitar for me. We're sitting here with a couple of guitars and um, just wanted to ask Steve some questions about being uh, the life of a luthier and just being a guitar maker. Um, so thanks so much for having me, Steve. Wonderful to have you here, Evan, and really enjoying hearing you playing on your new guitar. Oh, and thanks. on this beautiful day, we've got the snow is gently falling outside and um, it's a bit of magic in the air, and um, I feel like it's a it's a blessing for you know having you here when with the snow. So. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Well, I want to start out just on the subject of uh, guitar building and how did you come across guitar building? Why guitar? And um, take yeah. it from there. Oh boy, isn't it funny how how life unfolds? But it, it seems like a bit of destiny in some ways that, um, and I feel really fortunate. I just found what I I love I love doing. Sure. Somehow the guitar has become this sort of this muse, this passion, my, my lifestyle. But, um, but to make a long story short, I started music with piano, actually, where um, uh, my father, um, uh, well, actually, my grandfather was a pianist. My mother was a pianist. Um, and so I started playing piano. Sure. But when I found her guitar in uh. the closet, and we all have that moment, right, where <laughs> we're first introduced to a guitar, either hearing it or touching it, you can pick it up. Yeah. You can hold it with a piano. You need to go into that room and play it there. Right. You um, feel kind of like you, locked as a, as, a, as a kid playing piano too, right? It's like guitar anywhere. It's true. And it wasn't, it wasn't very cool. You yeah, know, sure. it wasn't one of the cool <laughs> instruments. And, and so I thought guitar, you can, you can bring it outside. You can, um, so I connected with it and immediately I was just sort of smitten. There was an old guitar. It had five strings on it. And I, but it was sort of love at first touch, you know. Sure. And, um, so basically I, I was playing a steel string guitar for a little while and then at college, you know, I uh, was introduced to classical guitar. Okay, I didn't realize. Of, uh, Bach, Villa Lobos, and I was, I was just in love with it. So I spent wow. a lot of time uh, just, just happily practicing um, wow. guitar, but I also loved art. Um, I've always enjoyed physics and engineering, just how things work, you know. Sure. And, and so when I found out that the finest guitars were made by actually individuals mm -hmm. rather than factories in general, it's individuals, that piqued my curiosity. And wow. then um, I thought, well, I'd like to try that, you know. Sure. And it was towards the end of college where you're wondering, well, what should I, what should I do from here? Right. So I thought, well, there's, um, I love the ocean. Um, uh, I like history. Uh, I like traveling. Underwater archaeology. That, that's interesting, right? You get to go to the Mediterranean, you know, and get on your gear and go look for artifacts and treasure. But I thought, what about rather than looking for treasure, what about making beautiful objects? Because that's really my goal is to just put beauty into the world. And rather than um, trying to find something, trying to create something. So I went to a school to learn how to build Guitars. I was the only one making a classical guitar. Um, oh wow! Okay. And I had a uh, actually a Velasquez, a Manuel Velasquez instrument, okay. based sure. heavily on the Torres Hauser tradition. Right. You know, sort of flat bottom. You know, shape. And right. Different shapes have their different sounds. Seven fan braces. Immaculate craftsmanship. So it set a really good standard um, to try to. <laughs> <laughs> sure. To go for at the being able to look in it and say that's the way everything's shaped. That's the way the back braces are shaped. That's the the top braces, the neck. And, what and he was a northeast builder too, yeah. right? Based yeah. in New York, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. Yep, yep. Born in Puerto Rico, and then was in New York, and then and then eventually Florida. Um, but I, I have I still have a lot of respect for those instruments. I've heard sure. some that I put on the same par. If I heard a Hauser and a Velasquez, I've heard some Velasquez that I, I sure. actually prefer. I think they're they're wonderful instruments. Wow. So, um, and was this like a as you were playing guitar and studying guitar, were you always kind of thinking like, wow, it'd be interesting to build one of these, or was it really not until afterwards that you were like, well, what am I going to do? Or, it's when I when I. Um, when I experienced that guitar, I started playing much better. Sure. You know, all of a sudden, Bach, you could have contrapuntal lines. Yeah. You got two lines. It wasn't just like a mess of notes. You know, you could actually distinguish. There's your tread. There's the different voicings. Sure. So my parents said, you're playing much better. What, what, you know, uh, what, what happened? They said, I was like, oh, the, the guitar is really like, it's just. Whoa. And also, when you, when you have a fine guitar, you play it with respect, mm. right? You know, it's not like, you, you know, each note, you'll be like, this is a, it's a jewel. It's a beautiful thing. Mm. And so... Um, 
respecting, I think, the instrument is a really great, you know, uh, way of looking at it every time you sure. play. And each note should be beautiful, can be beautiful, and on a good instrument, you can just um, sort of delight in the beauty of each note. So um, I think when I got interested in building, when I found out, okay, well, this beautiful guitar, this was made by, man, I was like, There's, who, who is this person? And yeah, then as yeah. you look more into the history, it's these individuals. And I think that was a confidence builder because if you think about steel string guitars, it tends to be more factories, right? You know, sure. Like Martin and Gibson and whatnot. And that makers would have a sound that also sort of fascinated sure. me, and it con continues to just sort of amaze me that there are people that just sort of have have a sound. And um, so um, after the course, I started just um, I, I got the fever. I, I built sure. one guitar, and it's um, it's sort of a magic act where you just see have these pieces of wood, well, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're. Uh, there's color, there's life, there's beauty. <laughs> You're able to just take what were just some potential energy, sure. you watch your hands, put it together, and then there's beauty. So wow. It, and it's satisfying that I think trying to make an extension of someone's soul, that yeah. they can explore music and life, a friend sure. that they can consult. I mean, to be able to have it's, it's an honor and, and uh, thrill to make something that can have that sort of relationship with someone where they can sure. just be like, this is my, this is my bestie, this is my buddy. I spend countless hours mm -hmm. and, um, sure. and ideally I want them to, um, you know, of course, find it inspiring and help them in terms of their, their either their career or just, just enjoying. I'll build for, I enjoy building sure. for players of all levels um, because what's important is just someone loving, you know, just having a great time with it. That's what really, of course, it's sure. great to have advanced players, but um, I also love to just hear from people who are like, I can't tell you how much I just like. At the end of the day, I just, you know, when I pick up the guitar, it just, it really fulfills my life in ways. Right. So, yeah. That's such an amazing thing. And like you, you said, you, you build for so many different, um, you know, levels of players, but you're, you're very well known in the classical guitar community for building for some of the most famous artists in the world. People like Elliot Fisk, the Assad brothers, Anjo Romero, uh, Annabel Montesinos, Marco Tamayo, Denis Azabajic, some people close to me, the Holzmans, and actually many of the younger generation of guitarists that are up and coming. When you build for players like these, um, what, what types of things do you learn from them? And what type of, how does that inform your building? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I love to just listen to these amazing artists work their magic and, um, you know, hear the tone, but also watching very closely to try to learn how I can improve and mm. how to make the right match for them. Because ideally, I hear them play, uh, get to know them for a while, their, their style, and, and then, you know, it does help when I'm building for them because I'll build very different guitars for different uh, guitarists. And um, does it make sense? I, I'm not sure, you know, it, it, maybe it's better to just have one model and that's very consistent. But what I found is mm, I really enjoy the challenge of building for these different musicians sure. and they might be a very different design. For example, with Elliot Fisk, he likes a deep bodied guitar. Mm. He wants really, he wants thunderous bass. He wants the timpani, you know, he, he really, um, he, he definitely wants the tone colors. Sure. Um, a lot to explore in orchestra and a guitar. Then when I built for Angel Romero, it's a very different request. Mm. It's a fast, 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 fast. So you want shallow box. Um, so that, and all of these parameters um, affect the sound and experience of the guitar, the shape of the guitar, the depth, you know, of course, the, the bracing, the scale, the, um, uh, the, the weight of the bridge, um, the type of wood for the soundboard. But um, they're radically different um, guitars in ways. It's just a different recipe for, so um, I'll try to, I guess I try to gauge what are the priorities here? You know, um, for some folks, it's a really fast response. Like say Marco Tamayo, that's got to be just sure. a very disciplined. Also the string return, it's got to be, things need to be very well disciplined. Right. And then um, I try to make a sort of, um, yeah, a, a sort of portrait, try to make a voice in a way. You're, yeah. you're trying to create the vocal cords in a way. I was going to uh, say, from, yeah. from talking yeah. with you, you were, you were saying like about, you know, some of the things that you do as far as um, trying to shape the voice of the guitar and, and, and how it plays, but you also are known for uh, making special, I mean, not that guitars in itself aren't a work of art, but you craft some of the aesthetics 
to the player sometimes with your portrait series as well. Is, is that right? And yeah. how did that oh, yeah. come to life? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, well, one, um, a guitar should be beautiful in every way, ideally, right? I mean, sure. it should, of course, sound, first and foremost, sound uh, beautiful. It should also feel nice, right? Yeah. And uh, someone had built a guitar and they brought it by and immediately I said, round the bindings more. It, it just, you know, sure. it, it should feel, you know, what if it's sharp right here? Then your first reaction, oh, right, I'm going to, ow. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should feel good. It should smell good. Yeah. Smell. I mean, not that that's a lower priority, but, um, you know, the aroma of a guitar is, yeah. can be amazing, especially older guitars, old Brazilian rosewood and Spanish cedar. I mean, it's just intoxicating. It's, it's wonderful. But, of course, it should look beautiful. It's, I mean, it, it reflects the elegance, and that's what I think of a classical guitar is it should have, should have this sort of underlying elegance to it. So have it look beautiful, and that's, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? So um, I've got a, a number of different uh, designs, some might be, you know, uh, someone might consider, oh, that's that's too colorful or something. I want some, but what I'll try to do is really match the aesthetic. And I've been doing all sorts of things, um, having a great time experimenting. I've done so many different things, but here's wow. the latest. Um, so yeah, this one has um, a story behind it. And I feel like with my guitars, I try to hide a lot of um, meaning in them throughout the process and also sort of in the alchemy of how they're made. There's a lot of hidden beauty that I put in. Um, this one, um, uh, this idea started with actually Rosie, uh, Rosie Bennett, fine, fine guitarist uh, from the UK. And I was making a portrait guitar for her. And I was like, what do you envision? Let, let's create, let's collaborate on sure. a musical work of art. You know, um, you like the sound of my guitar, let, but let's, spirits or cedar, what, should, what, are you, what are your priorities? What do you dream of in the instrument? And what would you like for the symbolism, you know, and the, and the rosette? So it's a joy. And she said, she liked the idea of this kintsugi, which I didn't know much about this Japanese sure. idea that um, in cracked pottery, especially, the cracks can be filled with gold and then it becomes something more beautiful. Ah, okay. And that's how it was sort of born in Japanese ceramics. And now it's applied in other ways, but it's um, symbolic and a sort of metaphor for being like in life. Um, sometimes the broken, um, broken things, there's, there's beauty and, and broken as well. And you can look sure. at that from people who have gone through things in life where don't we become more empathetic um, and beautiful souls from going through things that are difficult in life. Sure. You know? um, so um, there's a lot of symbolism in it, I think, especially for, for artists, for, for musicians who want to, we really, you want to express yourself, you want to put emotion through your playing. And so um, uh, together we designed a sort of cracked pattern for hers. Cool. And I just sort of thought, I try to go into a flow state when I build a lot. That's really what I try to achieve is this, this beautiful flow state where I'm sort of watching my hands and they'll do things and I'm sort of just surprised wow. by them. Just let them do their thing. Um, and now I'm, I'm coming up to 500 guitars and I think I've built like so my hands sort of know I don't need to. <laughs> I'm like, just do your things. And I think with guitars as well, right, there's certain sure. pieces where you can just be like, maybe it's best to not just they know what to do. Just not, yeah. you know, just uh, let them do their thing. So, so almost 500 guitars and hundreds of hours for each of these instruments. And you, you have to be so focused. I mean, a lot like how a musician will focus on, you know, polishing a piece and making a piece better. You mentioned this idea of flow state, which is very interesting to me because, you know, I think, I think we all kind of identify with like certain times that we're able to achieve a lot or be really focused and be relaxed in that process. Do you have tips for others that do have, are in any field or any musician um, of like ways that people can find their own flow state and, and create? I've got some things that have worked for me and everyone's different. There's some people who are night owls, there's some people morning people and everyone's different, but I put a lot of energy into trying to, to create the flow state. Sure. I think it's something that it wouldn't, it might not come naturally unless you try to set up the, wow. you know, set, set the stage um, for it. Um, so knowing yourself, right. uh, I think we'll talk a bit about philosophy today because that's the most important tool in any workshop is just your, your state of mind. But Socrates said, you know, know yourself. So 
I would think for flow state, for me, the mo most focused work and the way, the time to get your flow state, the morning, you know, for me, there's that sure. expression, Latin in the morning, do the hard stuff, like Bach in the morning, it's just, yeah, what okay. a beautiful way. It's also nice to revisit later in the day, but if you're gonna, I think that's a very focused time for me. So I'll, I'll write my lists so that the most challenging work uh -huh. is, is in the morning. Um, but to achieve the flow state, one, try to avoid tension. Don't Ooh. be too distracted. And these days, there are phones, you know. It's, right. I've fallen victim to it as well. You know, you're, you're so used to. And so sometimes turning off the ringer, you know, right. just be like, let's just unplug for a minute. Um, focus on your breathing. Sure. Um, definitely. Um, I just read a book, actually. A guitarist uh, gave it to me. And it's on. It's all about breathing, which mm. I think could probably apply some really important things for us from stage, uh, teaching stage, just um, how much we can hack our bodies through how we breathe. Sure. Free divers do it. Um, yeah. You know, you can really do um, just through things like breathing through your nose more. So for, for the flow state, um, breathing, diet, you know, making sure you, you're not you're not hungry, but you're not, you haven't overeaten sure. and you're just feeling like putting your feet up on the <laughs> couch. So, um, you know, taking care of your body, really celebrating it and even being warmed up to the right amount. As soon as I come to the workshop, I'll do simple things first. Mm. I'll, I'll do very simple because I'm warming up my hands and, and your is, mindset too right like yep. not jumping into a super difficult task right Something. exactly yep exactly wow. don't because that would be um your momentum it could be frustrating to be like oh, i'm going to something hard this isn't it's not working quite right set yourself right. up start easy have it be like hey everything is coming together and so i'll i'll warm up my hands my dexterity but like you're saying also also the mind so um but probably the most important thing for me with the flow state is music is mm. putting on music sure. and um so i always see videos of you like if you've got a little video of you working in your workshop or or maybe it's like a guitar that you just finished it's always a totally different style of music that i'll hear going <laughs> along it could be psychedelic a, yeah. or it could be like uh um some gregorian chant or something yeah. you know it could be anything I, I both have, psychedelic in a way but <laughs> so. yeah i i have fun i i tend to just try to be like a upfront just honest person and be like Hey, I'm listening to this today. And you know, you can make classical instruments, but also still listen to all sorts of music. And so I'll listen to all sorts of things depending on my frame of mind. And, um, and if I need to do a high energy task, um, then I'll put on something to match that. Cool. And if right. I put on, um, if I need to do something carving braces, I put on something that would be slow down, sculpt the braces as you'd see something in nature, um, mm. Take your time. That's that's the important time. Set up work, sculpting the braces. That's when it's really good to just um, just slow yourself. Take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. And no ten. Don't be distracted. And if it's not the right frame of mind, do it another time. Sure. Don't mess anything up. Have everything be be beautiful. So. Um, I like that subject of stay relaxed. That seems to be really what the what the essence of flow state is. Yeah. It's just like not not too much stress induced into it and. Uh, um, staying relaxed and not uh, not putting too much external pressure on yourself, right? Yeah, and that's a really good one. To, um, I think in general we're just healthy if we're just sort of like, don't let the weight of there can be things going on in the world. Just for a minute, just when you're playing guitar or building guitars, just let all that stuff go for a moment sure. and just create a dream like this flow-like state. And um, and I think that um, creatively it can do wonderful things as well. Um, you can come up with ideas that if I was overthink, if you're overthinking it, um, if you just sort of let yourself go, maybe something will just pop in. So some of the best ideas have come that way. And I talked with Thomas Humphrey actually about this one time when oh, wow. he he brought up um, uh, I ideas because he was he was he enjoyed the creative process, right? He was, sure. he was always trying things. Um, and he said, I have my best ideas in the shower. Sure. And I was like, oh, we're talking about you in the shower. <laughs> you know, I didn't think that would, yeah, but, but, but then, um, but I liked also his sort of candy just being like, yeah, that's when I have some of my best ideas right. in the shower. And I've noticed that actually, they, me, me too sometimes. Right. That's like the, a shower is like a whole nother, when you're in the shower, it's just this other world. You've got the water. It's sort of like a reset button. You're just yeah. getting recharged for the day, and it's just. Um, but rather than thinking about oh, I don't know, stressful stuff, just enjoy that. It just be 
like let's reflect for a moment just yeah. let the let the water on your you know beat on your head for a moment and um just just dream a little bit of, of the things that you'd like to um to do that day including sure. um what direction what do we do with this precious time you know we've got this time that we need to do make beautiful things or put beauty into the world and it's good to have a plan otherwise it just goes on by so i'll try to um, also use flow state to write down creative ideas sure. that another time I'll pursue. Well, it's nice. I feel like, uh, you know, as we, as, as time goes on, it's harder and harder to find moments where we're away from devices or distractions in general. And we're all doing so many different things, whether it's a musician practicing, performing, making videos, social media, all these different things. Um, but yeah, so it's, it becomes more and more rare to have these moments. Those moments are so precious now. You know, there are those moments where we can really um, reflect and grow and dream, right? Yeah, so. yeah and, it's, and it's good to carve those out, the sort of me time of being like, and I think there's something beautiful about solo time as well. Yeah. Just like it's, it's hard to have a flow state for me, and, and I think probably for a lot of people, if there's too much going on. Yeah. <laughs> there's too, if you're, if you're, You've got multiple conversations going on, and there's just, um, I think you need to celebrate this sort of almost like meditative time. Um, but carve it carve it out, whether it's in your, yeah, some people like to, to, to jog. Um, for me, swimming definitely is a way that I'll just slow down, take a deep breath. And so um, I think people in the arts, or actually in any sphere, could benefit from, like you're saying, in this sure. busy... Just, just take, we got to take care of ourselves. And also as musicians and builders, our hands, something in the last you know, couple years I've come to really celebrate is just like our hands are just these, they're, it's amazing what they do, you know, <laughs> and we've got to, um, um, so in the morning what I do is I start them off very gentle things. If it's cold out like this, I'll wear gloves. Sure. So I'm not going in uh, with cold hands, but, um, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll thank them as well. Yeah. You know, in Japan, I think they'll, once a year, they wrap up all the tools in the shop and they sort of thank, thank yeah. these tools. But I think every day I'm sort of being like, you know, um, thank you. Thank your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking with me a bit earlier about, um, some of these makers that you had experience with, um, either as mentors or you looked up to them or even you owned instruments by them like Velasquez and Thomas Humphrey. And how do you see this, um, like what you do um, as it relates to standing on the shoulders of some of these giants of guitar makers over time? Well, I think as, as players, we're, we're grateful to these luminaries of the past, right? I mean, for not, not only creating repertoire, like, you know, say the, the Bach cello suites transcribed by Segovia, thanks, Segovia. I mean, wow, that that was a great sure. contribute. Barrios, these composite, you know, just goes on and on. Wonderful players, wonderful pieces. Um, but from a maker standpoint, so fortunate to have this amazing just uh, history of instrument making, from uh, say Lacote, you know, uh, sure. Torres. It goes on and on through, um, and then you know these creative ideas of this evolution of the guitar, and then you see say with Boucher, and then one thing that comes up is the question of um, asymmetry versus symmetry. And that's Ooh. a subject that I'm really interested in lately. And um, if, if asymmetry can give you something better in a guitar, more sustain, more treble, more, more beauty to the note, well, how much asymmetry then? You know, because couldn't you go too far if you do too sure. much? then do you lose something? And so I've been looking at the famous luthiers to sort of figure out which camp might they be in of symmetry and asymmetry. Mm. I remember talking to Thomas Humphrey about that and he was very, he said, it's a myth. He was like asymmetry, <laughs> nope. But when you look at, if you line up a lot of the makers, you're like, oh, Santos Hernandez, he's doing asymmetry. Okay. Um, and Boucher ended up gravitating towards asymmetry. Interesting, seeing in their sort of progression, Friedrich, Symmetry, asymmetry, symmetry. Ah. They went back, it seems. Um, Rodriguez, asymmetry. Um, Ramirez, the older Ramirez that are more uh, better known, well, the early ones, symmetry, then asymmetry. So basically, um, I'm fascinated by always trying to improve my instruments. And um, for me, it seems that spruce, you don't need um, asymmetry, but for cedar, I like to have it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it depends on the tone wood that's being used or 
do you want some complexity in how the top is moving? Do you want to give the top a type of vibrato in a way where it's, it's, it's pulsing in a way rather than wow. an efficient air pump and be like, no, 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 this is, it's not a machine, it's an instrument. And maybe <sighs> putting in a tiniest bit of inefficiency is adding to the beauty of the tone. So um, say with Torres, looks symmetrical. If you look at it, seven fans, looks very symmetrical, but wait a minute, he was using mismatched tops sometimes. Wow. So sure. if you've got spruce from one tree here and one from another, and it's hard to see with unless you, from a photo, is it wider grain spacing? Is there any way on his best sounding ones, he was getting asymmetry with or without, no, or maybe he was just like, hey, these are both good pieces of wood. Ooh. Was he planning it? Um, he's a master, uh, so maybe. Uh, so basically, um, I've been researching this in Friedrich, one of the, show, <laughs> you know, I mean, thank all the make, I think all modern makers, you know, tip their hat to people like Friedrich, not only for really pioneering the, the scientific design, write it down, quantify it, measure it, you know, be, yes, we're, we're, there's an artistic side to being a guitar maker, but oh boy, if you're not scientific sometimes, it's, how are you gonna be consistent? You've gotta be sure. part scientist, part, part artist, and Friedrich is really the one who was very, um, very diligent about writing things down, quantifying things. So in 1988, he gave a speech in Paris about asymmetry oh. in guitar design. And he's, um, rest of me, he's much more knowledgeable than I am. I'm trying to learn from him and then, and then explore some ideas and maybe I hope to contribute any of the ideas that I find. But I don't think it was brought up in it um, that it might depend on the type of wood because spruce tends to have what, this clear clear sound, you know, right? right? It just tends to be cedar. Maybe you find asymmetry in more um, uh, cedar guitars because it needs just a little extra, uh, uh, that little extra sort of, a, um, of treble. Um, and I've heard some amazing cedar guitars. One, one of my favorite cedar guitars personally was um, a 1986 um, Rodriguez guitar belonging to, to Angel Romero. It's Hunter and Rosewood, Shallow Box. And when I was visiting him, he brought out a number of guitars. But that one, I was just like, Blown this away is a one. phenomenal one. You know, it's just just amazing. I was joking, why are you even playing my guitar when you <laughs> got this? But, um, you know, it's so, so good. Um, but um, something that's really influenced my design is actually bi biomimicry, learning from patterns in nature, engineering in nature, burnt bones, shells, whatnot, and trying to apply those to say how you shape braces in the guitar. Um, in nature, you don't see anything done without reason, right? And so mm -hmm. in a bird bone uh, or in a shell, it's there for a reason. So the other day as I was looking out, I love looking out at the pond, you know, I looked at this scallop shell I'd found and a beautiful, <laughs> Not only a beautiful orange color, and uh, but then I saw. Wait a minute! I saw you know bracing pattern. <laughs> it's one of the side effects of being a guitar maker. Everybody. Like, oh, I was gonna say, how do you know he's yeah, a guitar maker? I yeah. see show G screens. I'm like, how would that sound? And how? But so I mean, look at look at the. Okay, so you think about the focal point, right? And and some guitar makers will think about where should the focal point be? If you want to open up the base of a guitar and have the the struts more parallel to each other to the grain then you'll open it up and you'll see in say a flamenco guitar where they boom, 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 just give me some, give me some woof. If you want a little more control and cross grain uh, stiffness, you, uh, you can angle these um, more or you can have various focal points. But so when I looked at this, I thought, well, that, that's, that's a neat pattern of, okay, this would be a, um, uh, you know, early, early Ramirez and whatnot. Some people do like nine braces rather than seven, but what, got me thinking was, hey, look, if this was a bracing pattern, uh, it would be a highly domed top, but uh, <laughs> it'd also be, these fan struts would be wider at the base and they'd be narrower at the top. So they would be a, um, you know, sort of tapered hmm. fan brace. I thought, wow. wait a minute, I don't know if I've ever seen that in a guitar. I, it probably has been done and you know correct me if i'm wrong but i mean <laughs> I, I thought oh that's that's interesting and actually then the torque of the bridge is is pulling on the, the you know the saddle of the guitar this way so maybe you'd want it higher narrow and high might give you stronger and then as it goes out you're fading out you don't have as much pressure on the top so maybe going to low and wide so i thought i need to try this pattern then we could also get into oh look there's a, a ring here Hmm. 
should you open up the vibrations of the soundboard to go into the upper bow? That's another question that I think wow. a lot of makers from, uh, especially, you know, Marlon Nios and Boucher and people who would open up the waist brace, um, Antonio Montero, there's a lot of makers that have experimented with that. Or just on one side, do you do it asymmetrically? Um, some other makers you see on a small one, it's much more, he very heavily built here. Um, Friedrich experimented with two braces here, same with Fleda. Um, so are you letting this ring up here? Are you just letting it do the work down here? And this one, if you translated this, which is just sort of fun exercise, why not <laughs> consider it? It's exercising the mind. What would this work engineering wise? You'd have a waist brace that would curve this way. So then you'd still be providing some support right where the bridge is trying to collapse the top here. But then you'd be actually opening up these, the, the modes, the way the air you know, pumps and this vibrates, you'd be opening this up a little bit more here. So the mode would, rather than cutting off here, would might come up a little bit more. So, um, so living on Cape Cod and being surrounded by beautiful, beautiful nature and shells, it's also very engaging for the mind with these questions such as symmetry and versus asymmetry. It seems like in terms of that question, um, nature tends to go with symmetry, right? I sure. Mean, I, I, there's few, I'm trying to think of examples. It'd be interesting to just sort of see. No, like um, traditionally, you know, people would think of a face being most beautiful if it was symmetrical, yet everyone's face is slightly asymmetrical from the left to right side. But that's sort of what creates a unique person. You know, it's like we, we notice these little features that we would like never change about like our best friends or that our parents that, you know, there's these little differences, a mole on the right side where you don't have that on the left yeah. side. It's part of their character. Yeah. Maybe that's it. That's one little example. So right? Maybe it's actually a little bit of asymmetry. Yeah. You know, just a little bit. The hair right. can part to one side, the right. heart and the intestines. There you go. There's like, there's asymmetry. It just, you wouldn't see it. Right. Um, right at first, you'd say, oh, symmetrical. It's so mostly maybe symmetrical. Gets, yeah. So maybe, maybe the guitar, but a little bit of asymmetry. Right. So By the way, a question on that, just because my mind immediately, when you say asymmetry, I think about the bracing pattern being asymmetrical. Maybe you put an extra brace on one side and not the other. But is there other ways that asymmetry can apply when you're building an instrument that, that's interesting to you, like thicknessing or what, what, what other... Uh, Am I on the right track here? Absol or? Absolutely. Okay. And, and also, I mean, right off the bat, maybe it's not, um, there's some asymmetry that you've got the different strings, right? You've got a different tension load. I do sort of cant my neck so that this will come out much mm. closer in height. Um, so there are other, you know, there are parts of the system that um, you can you could thickness the top. Um, so you could make it thinner on, say, more flexible on, say, the base side if you wanted to. Um, uh, I'm sure it's been tried where you actually make the box um, asymmetrical in its depth. And um, oh. there's a, this um, Diaz guitar from Portugal that I have the plans for over there. Huh. And his, the, actually the, um, the sides aren't parallel in that plan. They're actually, they slope this way. Huh. But you know, for for me having the sound port here, that's one of the most dramatic differences of sure. uh, um, asymmetry in it. Where I've seen some with two, which um, the symmetrical, which um, yeah, I could can work in some ways. I mean, for me, the way I hold the guitar, and many I think some of the sound would be going going that way. But it could reduce cancellation of similar waves um, within the box. But wow, but, well, it's fascinating. You know, earlier too, you were talking with me uh, about some ideas and just some fun things that you're working on and sort of projects that you want to try as it relates to spruce, I believe you were saying, right? Well, yep. can you tell me more about that? Yes, I think that, um, um, I mean, a good analogy to, um, to making instruments is also like making food, right? You want to use the best quality ingredients, first mm. of all, right? Sure. It's, you, you'll be limited if you don't use good ingredients. So um, a lot of guitar makers go on the quest being like, well, I want soundboards in particular that are just, they, they give me the sound I want they, um, uh, for my sort of recipe. So um, I was reading the, uh, the Romanios book on Torres the other day, which I read years ago, but it's good to revisit these things. Sometimes sure. you read a book later and you'll just, other things will be, you know, get you thinking. So sure. there's a section on spruce and um, I use Swiss, Swiss spruce tops. Um, and I, I, I love the quality of them. I think they're seasoned well. And then I do my own sort of seasoning uh, in the workshop. And they're talking about 
how did Torres season his spruce tops? I said, this is a good, let, let's um, <laughs> Some salt thank you, Romanios, for writing this book. What a, what a yeah. wonderful topic. Um, did he bake them in the sun? Mm. You know, um, it's a good idea. You know, I've built, actually, sometimes building guitars in the sun or French polish in the sun. It'll, uh, I think it can be good for it. But they mentioned, and Romanios mentioned in this book, the bleeding of spruce, that Torres mm. might have used spruce that was bled and there was a practice called the bleeding of spruce where the sap was taken out of the tree, maybe to use wow. a burgundy pitch, um, but also turpentine has been known as something that you can make from the sap of pine or spruce. Wow. And, and how do you even do that? Are, how do you remove the sap from So you pretty much, you, you, you hack out the bark and then that, once you've gone through oh, the bark, wow. um, all the, the sap will start pouring out and then it was probably scraped and wow. used for either um, incense, medicinal purposes, finishes. Um, but then I got thinking, well, after that sap has come out of the tree, if you then harvest the tree, wouldn't it be lighter? I mean, sap is, uh, that's a lot of the, the weight and content of a tree. And maybe you'd get a stiffer, lighter tone wood. Sure. So maybe Torres was working with some very nice sound boards that gave him an edge and um, the same question has come up with Stradivarius and his, oh, was it, you know, there was a mini ice age where the tops, you know, um, his soundboards made from tighter grain, mm. or were they transported in rivers where, you know, small uh, bugs and worms were eating sure. away and perforating the wood. Um, but with Torres, how do we know what <laughs> that spruce was like? And wouldn't it be great if we could build with that again or just hold that Jeez. material? But um, so that really piqued my curiosity. So my sort of, as I approach my 500th guitar, I'm sort of reflecting on all that's come and all these good things that have, that have happened and, uh, and all the things that I'd like to explore. But one of them is I wanna have, um, I wanna just continue to try to improve to make the most beautiful instruments I can. And having the best tone wood for, sure. for the sound boards is, is really important. So I'm gonna contact my, my tone wood supplier and see if they know about this practice of, of bled spruce because I feel like that's the way you could get an edge and I do chase percentages. I go through these artistic odysseys and try to include <laughs> scallop shells, but I'm also a art scientist and I'll say, if I could get a wood that's just as stiff and it's 10% lighter, I want to try that. That sure. might be able to give me a bit more of that just open singing character that I'm always striving for yeah. in instruments. Well, so. speaking of the sound you're striving for, um, of course, you know, we talked a little bit about how you personalize instruments and, uh, you know, s certain artists demand certain things from their instruments and you follow it with that. Um, of course, every single one of these instruments that you build, it starts with you in the workshop building it. So what, if you could describe, how could you describe the type of things, some of the characteristics of the sound that you look for uh, or that you hope for when you string up an instrument? Yeah, I mean, I ideally... Um an enchanting tone with a bit of a bit of magic in it. Something where it's just got some life. It's singing. It. It's resonant. It it's sweet. It's inviting. It has harmonics that are, are rich and complicated. It makes you want to play it again and explore and explore a little more. Can I do that? Yeah. Is it expressive? Is it? Um, is it friendly? I don't want it. It sounds mm, sort of stressed. I want something that sounds um, also inviting, but I want it to be able to be very, very clear and disciplined and, uh, you know, have a wide variety of colors. And I feel like that's more important to volume than me is just having an instrument that is really uh, fun for people to explore. Some sure. people like to park it here and just brrr and do their thing. That's that's wonderful. But for me, one of my visions, I, I, really, I, I really like hearing people play that type of expressive music. And I feel like that's one one of the things that guitar has an edge over some other instruments. That yeah. with violin, I feel, like, or, or piano, or someone's, they have their fortes, but we've got all of this, um, all of it. And some people can just, with their nails, they can stay in the <laughs> same place to it. But um, but to try to answer your question quickly, because I could go on and on, <laughs> yeah, on right. I, I, I just want a bit of, um, That you could play anything. You could play just a simple chord, and it's just 
just a simple chord is just beautiful. It's just got like a whole symphony of harmonics and, and I like to give myself the goosebumps. I know it's a good guitar if, if I can just um, do that. So um, it needs to have a, quite a bit of evenness. Again, back to Friedrich. He wrote down the criteria for a good guitar and all of these things helped um, me as a maker and, um, and all of these, I mean, the craftsmanship of say living makers like say uh, Paco uh, Marin, Sure. Um, that's, that means whew, we got to up our game. When you see that sort of craftsmanship in Velasquez, Hauser, Paco Ridge, you're like, whew, setting the sure. standard. And it encourages us to, to grow as makers. So, um, uh, but Friedrich was uh, a wonderful one writing down that criteria. Is it even? Does it sustain? Does it have enough power? And I think power is, is an important one, not only because players want it, but I think some of the most musical instruments do have they're, they're ready to speak. They're open. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's been really fascinating learning more about, um, you know, your idea of the sound, some of your process about building guitars and where really where your inspiration and creativity comes from. Um, I thought maybe we could, um, we, we could take a moment just for you to tell me about some of the amazing things that you've done to this guitar that you've made for me. Um, Absolutely, yeah. One of the things that I found was very striking that I know you were excited to show me too um, was this was a saddle that you made from wood, uh, which I had never seen before. Um, and it's both beautiful and what you were describing it, it, it serves some purposes too. Can you can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, the saddle. This area is one of the most important on on the guitar and. Say with analogy with the car, it's with the tires. If your tires are deflated, no matter what your engine is, or your <laughs> suspension or brakes, it, it'll only perform so much. So I've learned along the way, get this fit just right for the saddle. You're just gonna get better energy transfer. And then I noticed with different types of saddle materials, even bleached or unbleached bone, cow bone versus fossilized mastodon versus Jeez. camel bone, there's subtle differences if you're really, you know, um, listening carefully. And then I, I sort of went on an odyssey of trying all sorts of materials from <laughs> wow. even swordfish bill to brass to just, you know, work. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to work so far in an area, in a direction that you find the limit of where it starts. Say brass, it started getting metallic, obviously. The sustain was more, but um, it was a metallic sound. So I settled on, um, I sort of found this, this material and I feel like it's the perfect match um, wow. for bringing out a open, wooden, natural sound in the guitar. And I think actually Torres' first guitar, I think that the strings just went right to, to wooden bridge. There, wasn't, oh, sure. there was like some that, um, and then of course someone would say, well, don't do that, because then you can't adjust. How do you adjust your action? And <laughs> right. want it wear eventually. And so, but this is Sonoran um, Desert Ironwood. So this is from the Sonoran Desert, uh, very dense ironwood. Um, one of the densest woods is, is lignum vitae, African blackwood's also dense, but I think this one is the densest wood that I have. And um, I had a bone saddle in your guitar. Sure. And my, so my intuition, again, this is sort of a flow state thing, is intuition, I think, is a type of flow state. That's when you're like listening to an inner voice. Sure. If you're distracted, your inner voice might not be able to speak as clearly, but if you're, if you're able to listen, say, my, my gut is saying, try that in there. And with the saddle, yeah. you can A, B it really easily. Right. Take it out, put another one in. So you'll be equipped with um, at least one of these and then the bone. And uh, I'm curious to hear, you've got sure. um, such a good ear and musician that hearing your feedback. Um, so basically I, I shaped a saddle. I've intonated it as well. You I know, see I, that. I, I, I notched by the G um, and the A and the E. Um, and my saddle's at a little bit of an angle to try to get the compensation nice. Wow. But how would you describe the, the tone from it? Um, oh my gosh. Well, you know, we haven't, the, the thing is I'm, I'm, under, I'm, I'm learning about the sound of this amazing guitar, but we haven't tried the, yeah, we haven't yeah. tried the bone one. So I'm so curious, but right now, the things that I've noticed from this guitar are just, I mean, the, definitely, like you, I love what the words you use there, the complexity to the overtones. And the bloom of the notes is very natural to me. Mm -hmm. 
I've learned very quickly that every string has a character to it that is, that makes you want to explore that string more, which I love the second string on this guitar. In low positions, but also in high positions. And then the first string just, sing. I mean, we have to have a first string that sings. It's just, it's unacceptable if it doesn't, right? That's where we play so many of our melodies, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and this first string is just. It's gorgeous. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I gotta imagine that this plays such a amazing, such a such a big part of uh, the sound. I can't wait to try the different materials too. You, you've got me equipped with too many options, honestly. With the <laughs> with the soundboard, I'm gonna drive myself yeah. crazy just <laughs> swapping things in and out. But you know what? I I did want to uh, ask you about that because, well, while I've seen your guitars now for, for many years, not, not owning one, but from many of my colleagues and friends and when I was studying at Florida State and, and onwards, um, lots of people had your guitars around. And one of the most striking features that I always noticed and loved was the sound port with this magnetic, this magnetic sound port where you can remove it completely and you get this more airy and direct sound towards you as the player, or you could have it half open if it's too much. For you or completely closed if maybe um, you know you, you want to hear uh, a quiet instrument that you're playing with like another guitarist for instance uh, it's been such a fun um, thing to discover can you tell me about some of the purposes of this I, I know it's not just about hearing yourself better but it's also uh, changes the um, main air resonance of the guitar as well right it uh, does and the main air resonance can be um, sort of charted by muting the strings and gently tapping on the top and it will it will raise yeah, yeah. and these are voiced very similar yeah right? just a hair below a um, sure. with it with it um and and for my guitars i never want it above an a um and some people say oh it's too high it should be f sharp or g but actually you can still get a very meaty um yeah you can get a nice bass um uh, you can still support a good fundamental in the bass um, with a resonance at A here, because with this close, it would actually be a little lower. It'd be more, so it's more responding more like a G. Um, wow. Being such luthier, <laughs> luthier geek talk, but it's but it's what no, a it's lot fascinating. Of <laughs> do is chart this, and I like to do an F sharp sometimes, and I sort of figure out what would be the right match for the player. And I feel like if you go too deep, then the, you could start maybe losing the friendly character of some of the upper high notes on my guitar. Everybody's different, but so I, I tend to like a range of um, G to A, but I'm thinking of trying a new model, this sort of dark and mysterious and really explore this other range. Sure. Why not? Same with double tops. At first I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm happy doing single tops. So glad that I, I started exploring. It's new possibilities. I feel like we should, uh, you, uh, there's nothing wrong with exploring. And I've really enjoyed the double top Odyssey just getting started with that. So I might try one where I'm like, let's get it below, let's get it down to an E and sure. see how, and a Tornavos is an easy way. I also made the removable Tornavos sure. here. So of course, that's the easiest way to lower that sort of resonance, but I'd like to get it really low without the Tornavos. Um, sure. But it sort of started actually right, right here in Paris. So this is actually the Seine. Seine River. Here's Pont Neuf. Oh. So um, I thought I'd, I hide things in my guitar. So um, my son had said, "Okay, for this a crack pattern, Kintsugi. Think like a creek, because we'd gone up an airplane. It's so beautiful looking at the cape from an airplane." I said, "Well, rather than creek, a river. Well, what's a river that has meaning to me? Well, where did I fall in love with and really learn how to listen and play guitar? Paris. So I was like, let's put the Seine. So this is what the Seine looks like. The aerial view of it." Um, huh. And that's where I was studying with Tanya Chagno uh, a long, long time ago, and she she really taught me how to hear. And she she had a beautiful Friedrich 
Um, it's fun to hear it in St. Germain and, and just hear a great guitar at a great church. And huh. this is when I was still in, in college. And um, but she said, listen, you need to listen better. And she is right. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't really listening to the guitar. So I said, play into a window. Go like, here, go like this and then, okay. And then listen to it. Listen to it. Is it round? Is it here? Now yeah. listen to it. Listen to the difference. So she was trying to get me to listen. <laughs> and you're like, I'll just and cut so a I hole said, in the side of my guitar. So I was like, well, why isn't there a hole in the side of the guitar? You know, because it's just, and so when I started experimenting with this and people thought I was crazy, I'd drill, drill this hole and then I'd put duct tape over it. It was just to, for yourself to listen for even like tuning, you know, you can just hear yourself tune better if, sure. there, if you're getting a monitor and then you would close it to, but then um, a bunch of things happened as the, um, as I started developing these, uh, all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, maybe the sound stage is a little more open. Now, maybe if you're in a concert hall, maybe they can hear better. It's not as directional. You sort of open the sound stage. I've certainly so, noticed that with it open, it has a little bit more open of a presence for the listener too, not just the, not just the guitarist. That's what I've found. And for some folks, it might be like, oh, I, I want to hear the other person more so they can close it. But I, that's what sure. I um, uh, would hope is that you're just sort of opening the experience for the, the hall, the listener, and also just letting the tone breathe a bit mm. more. It's just sure. a let, like how we're saying with the flow state, so could you just relax? Maybe with the tone of the guitar, I, for mine, I never want something too like too tight or stressed out. I want it to be sort of like there's uh, with a towel, there's some folks are like a, a wet towel, uh, you know, and, some, and I want my guitars to be like a warm, like you get out of the shower and oh, it's like a warm, yeah, it's comforting. It's nice. in a way. Yeah. No, not like a wet, oh, it's like a wet towel, oh, but so with the guitar, I want it to be inviting. inviting. Yeah. And um, so um, this helped early on because um, uh, when I was just starting to do it, a lot of people who were just either wanted to fill a space um, a bit more fully or, or just have a different experience of just say harmonics are quite magical with it open. I mean, you're just, you're in the harmonic finally, these harmonics are usually sure. floating out this way, but when you're actually sort of in it, it's quite beautiful. Well, this has been such a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, I mean, this entire weekend here, just get to know you better, uh, how you make these incredible instruments and all the love and inspiration that goes into it. So I want to thank you for building this guitar for me and for having me here, Thank Steve. you, Evan. Thank Great you. to have you here. Thanks thank so you. much. Bye. Uh, for those of you interested um, in Steve's guitars, you can find him all over the place on social media, on his website, stephenconnorguitars.com. Yeah. Connor Guitars. Great, Connor yeah. Guitars, great. Yeah. Thanks.